Book four, part one of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Memoirs of Chateaubriand, volume three, by Francois René de Chateaubriand. Translated by Alexander Texera de Matos. Book four, part one. Bonaparte had refused to embark in a French ship, setting value at that time only on the English navy, because it was victorious. He had forgotten his hatred, the calumnies, the outrages with which he had overwhelmed perfidious Albion. He saw none now worthy of his admiration, save the triumphant party, and it was the undaunted that conveyed him to the harbour of his first exile. He was not without anxiety as to the manner in which he would be received would the french garrison hand over to him the territory which it was guarding of the italian islanders some wished to call in the english others to remain free of all masters the tricolor and the white flag waved on near headlands all was arranged nevertheless when it became known that bonaparte was bringing millions with him opinions generously decided to receive the august victim the civil and religious authorities were brought round to the same conviction joseph philip arigi the vicar-general issued a charge divine providence said the pious injunction has decreed that in future we shall be the subjects of napoleon the great the island of elba raised to so sublime an honour receives the lord's anointed in its bosom we order that a solemn te deum be sung by way of thanksgiving etc the emperor had written to general d'alem commanding the french garrison that he must make known to the people of elba that he had selected their island for his residence in consideration of the gentleness of their manners and of their climate he set foot on land at porto ferrajo amid the dual salute of the english frigate which had brought him and the batteries on shore thence he was taken under the parish canopy to the church where the te deum was sung the beadle the master of ceremonies was a short fat man who was unable to join his hands across his person napoleon was next conducted to the mayor's where his lodging was prepared they unfurled the new imperial standard a white ground intersected by a red stripe strewn with three gold bees three violins and two basses followed him with scrapings of delight the throne hastily erected in the public ballroom was decorated with gilt paper and pieces of scarlet cloth the actor's side of the prisoner's nature accommodated itself to these displays napoleon made a serious business of trifles even as he used to amuse his court with little old-time games inside his palace at the tuileries going out afterwards to kill men by way of pastime he formed his household it consisted of four chamberlains three orderly officers and two harbingers of the palace he stated that he would receive the ladies twice a week at eight o'clock in the evening he gave a ball he took possession for his own residence of the pavilion intended for the engineers bonaparte was constantly meeting in his life the two sources from which it had issued democracy and the royal power his strength was derived from the citizen masses his rank from his genius and therefore you see him pass without effort from the market square to the throne from the kings and queens who crowded round him at erfurt to the bakers and oilmen who danced in his barn at porto ferrajo he had something of the people among princes and of the prince among the people at five o'clock in the morning in silk stockings and buckled shoes he presided over his masons in the island of elba established in his empire inexhaustible in iron since the days of virgil insula inexhaustis calibum generosa metallis bonaparte had not forgotten the outrages to which he had lately been subjected he had not renounced his intention of tearing off his winding-sheet but it suited him to seem buried only to make some appearance of a phantom around his monument that is why he was eager as though thinking of nothing else to go down into his quarries of specular iron and adamant one would have taken him for the ex-inspector of mines of his former states he repented of having once appropriated the revenue of the forges of ilba to the legion of honour five hundred thousand francs now seemed to him worth more than a blood-bathed cross on the breast of his grenadiers what was i thinking of he said but i have issued many stupid decrees of that nature he made a commercial treaty with leghorn and proposed to make another with genoa at all hazards he began to make five or six furlongs of high road and designed the sites of four large towns just as dido laid out the boundaries of carthage a philosopher who had seen too much of human greatness he declared that he intended thenceforth to live like a justice of the peace in an english county and notwithstanding 
on climbing a height which overlooks porto ferrajo these words escaped him at the sight of the sea which flowed up on every side at the foot of the cliffs the devil it must be owned that my island is very small he had visited his domain within a few hours he wished to join to it a rock called pianosa europe will accuse me he said laughing of already having made a conquest the allied powers made merry over the fact that they had in derision left him four hundred soldiers he needed no more to bring them all back to the flag napoleon's presence on the coast of italy which had witnessed the commencement of his glory and which retains his memory agitated everybody murat was his neighbour his friends strangers secretly or publicly landed at his retreat his mother and his sister the princess pauline visited him they expected soon to see marie louise and her son arriving a woman did in fact appear with a child she was received with great mystery and went to live in a secluded villa in the most remote corner of the island on the shores of ogyger calypso spoke of her love to ulysses who instead of listening to her thought of how to defend himself against the suitors after two days repose the swan of the north put out to sea again to land among the myrtles of baja carrying away her little one in her white yawl if we had been less trustful it would have been easy for us to perceive an approaching catastrophe bonaparte was too near his cradle and his conquests his funeral island should have been more distant and surrounded by more waves it is inexplicable how the allies had come to think of banishing napoleon to the rocks where he was to serve his apprenticeship in exile was it possible to believe that at the sight of the apennines that when smelling the powder of the fields of montenotte ariola and marengo or that on discovering venice rome and naples his three fair slaves his heart would not be seized with irresistible temptations had they forgotten that he had stirred up the earth and that he had admirers and debtors everywhere all of whom were his accomplices his ambition was deceived not extinguished misfortune and revenge rekindled its flames when the prince of darkness from the verge of the created universe looked upon man and the world he resolved to destroy them before bursting forth the terrible captive restrained himself for some weeks in the huge public bank at faro which he was holding his genius negotiated a fortune or a kingdom the fouché the guzman's d'alfarache swarmed the great actor had long made his police the home of melodrama and had reserved the upper stage for himself he amused himself with the vulgar victims who disappeared through the trap-doors of his theatre bonapartism in the first year of the restoration passed on from simple desire to action in the measure as its hopes increased and as it became better acquainted with the weak character of the bourbons when the intrigue had been hatched without it was hatched within and the conspiracy became flagrant under the able administration of m ferrand m de la valette undertook the correspondence the mails of the monarchy carried the dispatches of the empire concealment was abandoned the caricatures foretold a desired return one saw eagles entering by the windows of the palace of the tuileries through the doors of which issued a flock of turkeys the nain jaune of vert spoke of plume de cannes warnings came from every side and were disbelieved the swiss government had gone out of its way to no purpose to inform his majesty's government of the intrigues of joseph bonaparte who had retreated to the pays de vaux a woman arriving from elba gave the most circumstantial details of what was happening at porto ferrajo and the police sent her to prison people held for certain that napoleon would not venture any attempt before the dissolution of the congress and that in any case his views would turn upon italy others still better advised prayed that the little corporal the ogre the prisoner might land on the french coast that would be too great a stroke of luck they would settle him at one blow m pozzo di bergo declared at vienna that the delinquent would be strung up to the nearest tree were it possible to have certain papers one would there find the proof that as early as eighteen fourteen a military conspiracy was contrived and went side by side with the political conspiracy which the prince de talleyrand was conducting at vienna at fouche's instigation napoleon's friends wrote to him that if he did not hasten his return he would find his place taken at the tuileries by the duc d'orleans they imagined that this revelation served to hurry the emperor's return i am convinced of the existence of these plottings but i also believe that the determinative cause which decided bonaparte was simply the nature of his genius the conspiracy of drouet d'erlon and lefebvre d'ennuet had broken out a few days before those generals froze in arms i was dining with m le marchal so who had been appointed minister of war on the third of december eighteen fourteen the simpleton was describing louis eighteenth's time of exile at hartwell the marshal listened to each detail he answered with the words that's historical 
they used to bring his majesty's slippers that's historical on days of abstinence the king used to take three new-laid eggs before commencing his dinner that's historical this reply struck me when a government is not solidly established every man whose conscience goes for nothing becomes according to the greater or lesser amount of energy in his character a quarter or a half or three quarters of a conspirator he awaits the decision of fortune more traitors are made by events than by opinions suddenly the telegraph announced to napoleon's braves and to the doubters that the man had landed monsieur hurried to lyon with the duc d'orleans and marshal macdonald and returned forthwith marshal so denounced in the chamber of deputies gave up his office on the eleventh of march to the duc de felt bonaparte found facing him as minister of war of louis the eighteenth in eighteen fifteen the general who had been his last minister of war in eighteen fourteen the boldness of the enterprise was unprecedented from the political point of view this enterprise might be regarded as the irremissible crime and capital fault of napoleon he knew that the princes still assembled at the congress that europe still under arms would not suffer him to be reinstated his judgment must have warned him that a success if he obtained one would be only for a day he was offering up to his passion for reappearing on the scene the repose of a people which had lavished its blood and its treasures upon him he was laying open to dismemberment the country from which he derived all that he had been in the past and all that he will be in the future in this fantastic conception lay a ferocious egoism and a terrible absence of gratitude and generosity towards france all this is true according to practical reason for a man with a heart rather than brains but for beings of napoleon's nature there exists a reason of another sort those creatures of lofty renown have ways of their own comets describe curves which evade calculation they belong to nothing they seem good for nothing if a globe finds itself on their passage they shatter it and return into the abysses of the sky their laws are known to god alone extraordinary individuals are monuments of human intelligence they are not its rule bonaparte therefore was persuaded to his enterprise less by the false reports of his friends than by the needs of his genius he took up the cross by virtue of the faith that was in him to a great man to be born is not everything he must die was elba an end for napoleon could he accept the sovereignty of a vegetable patch like diocletian at salona if he had waited till later would he have had more chances of success at a time when his memory would have aroused less emotion when his old soldiers would have left the army when new social positions would have been adopted well then he committed a foolhardy act against the world at the commencement he must have believed that he had not deceived himself as to the spell of his power one night that of the twenty fifth of february at the end of a ball of which the princess borghese was doing the honours he made his escape with victory along his comrade and accomplice he crossed a sea covered with our fleets met two frigates a ship of seventy-four guns and the man-of-war brig zephyr which spoke and questioned him he himself replied to the captain's questions the sea and the waves saluted him and he pursued his course the deck of the inconstant his little ship served him as a room for exercise and as a writing closet he dictated amid the winds and had copies made on that shifting table of three proclamations to the army and to france some feluccas carrying his companions in adventure flew the white flag strewn with stars around his admiral bark on the first of march at three o'clock in the morning he struck the coast of france between cannes and antibes in the gulf juin he landed strolled along the riviera gathered violets and bivouacked in a plantation of olive trees the dumbfounded population retired he avoided antibes and threw himself into the mountains of grass passing through senon baem guine and gap at sisteron twenty men could have stopped him and he found nobody he went on meeting no obstacle among those inhabitants who a few months earlier had wished to cut his throat whenever a few soldiers entered the void which formed around his gigantic shadow they were invincibly drawn on by the attraction of his eagles his fascinated enemies sought him and did not see him he hid himself in his glory as the lion of the sahara hides himself in the rays of the sun to avoid the sight of the dazzled hunters enveloped in a fiery cyclone the bloody phantoms of areola marengo austerlitz jena friedland eilau the moskowa lutzen bautzen formed his retinue with a million of dead from the midst of this column of fire and smoke there issued at the entrance to the towns a few trumpet blasts mingled with the signals of the tricoloured labarum and the gates of the town fell when napoleon crossed the neman at the head of four hundred thousand foot and a hundred thousand horse to blow up the palace of the tsars in moscow he was less astonished than when 
breaking his ban and flinging his irons in the faces of the kings, he came alone from Cannes to Paris, to sleep peacefully at the Tuileries. Beside the prodigy of the invasion of one man must be placed another, which was the consequence of the first. The legitimacy was seized with a fainting fit. The failure of the heart of the state attacked the members and rendered France motionless. For twenty days Bonaparte marched on by stages, his eagles flew from steeple to steeple, and, along a road of two hundred leagues, the government, masters of everything, disposing of money and men, found neither the time nor the means to cut a bridge, to throw down a tree, so as to delay at least by an hour, the progress of a man to whom the populations offered no opposition, but whom also they did not follow. This torpor on the part of the government seemed the more deplorable inasmuch as public opinion in Paris was greatly excited. It would have countenanced anything, despite the defection of Marshal Ney. Benjamin Constant wrote in the newspapers. After visiting our country with every plague, he left the soil of France. Who would not have thought that he was leaving it for ever? Suddenly he appears, and again promises Frenchmen liberty, victory, and peace. The author of the most tyrannical constitution that ever ruled France, he speaks to-day of liberty. But it was he who, during fourteen years, undermined and destroyed liberty. He had not the excuse of memory, the habit of power. He was not born in the purple. It was his fellow-citizens whom he enslaved, his equals whom he loaded with chains. He had not inherited power. He desired and meditated tyranny. What liberty is he able to promise? Are we not a thousand times more free than under his empire? He promises victory, and three times he forsook his troops, in Egypt, in Spain, and in Russia, abandoning his companions in arms to the triple agony of cold, destitution, and despair. He brought upon France the humiliation of invasion. He lost the conquests which we had made before him. He promises peace, and his name alone is a signal for war. The nation unhappy enough to serve him would again become the object of European hatred. His triumph would be the commencement of a combat to the death against the civilized world. He has therefore nothing to claim, nor to offer. Whom could he convince, or whom seduce? War at home, war abroad. Those are the gifts which he brings us. Marshal Sow's Order of the Day, dated 8th March, 1815, repeats very nearly the ideas of Benjamin Constant, with an effusion of loyalty. Soldiers. The man who lately, before the eyes of Europe, abdicated the power which he had usurped, and which he had so fatally abused, has landed on French soil, which he was never to see again. What does he want? Civil war. What does he seek? Traitors. Where will he find them? Shall it be among those soldiers whom he has so often deceived and sacrificed by misleading their valour? Shall it be in the heart of those families which the mere sound of his name still fills with terror? Bonaparte despises us enough to believe us capable of abandoning a lawful and dearly beloved sovereign to share the fate of a man who is no longer more than an adventurer. He believes this, the madman, and his last act of insanity reveals him to us as he is. Soldiers, the French army is the bravest army in Europe. It will also be the most faithful. Let us rally round the banner of the lilies, at the voice of the father of the people, the worthy heir of the virtues of Henry the Great. He himself has traced for you the duties which you have to fulfil. He places at your head that prince, the model of French knighthood, who, by his happy return to our country, has already once driven out the usurper, and who to-day, by his presence among us, will destroy his soul and last hope. Louis the Eighteenth appeared on the 16th of March in the Chamber of Deputies. The destinies of France and of the world were at stake. When His Majesty entered, the deputies and the strangers in the galleries uncovered and rose. Cheers shook the walls of the house. Louis XVIII slowly mounted the steps of his throne. The princes, the marshals, and the captains of the guards ranged themselves on either side of the king. The cheers ceased, none spoke. In that interval of silence, one seemed to hear the distant footsteps of Napoleon. His Majesty, seated, cast his eyes over the assembly, and in a firm voice delivered this speech. Gentlemen, at this critical moment, when the public enemy has penetrated into a part of my kingdom, and threatens the liberty of all the remainder. I come into your midst to knit yet more closely the ties which, uniting you to myself, constitute the strength of the State. I come by addressing you to make manifest my feelings and my wishes to the whole of France. I have seen my country again. I have reconciled it with foreign powers, who will, you may be sure, be faithful to the treaties which have restored peace to us. I have laboured for the good of my people. I have received— I continue daily to receive the most touching marks of its love. Could I, at sixty years of age, better end my career than by dying in its defence? I fear nothing, therefore, for myself. 
but i fear for france he who comes to kindle among us the torches of civil war brings with him also the scourge of foreign war he comes to put back our country under his iron yoke he comes lastly to destroy the constitutional charter which i have given you that charter which will be my proudest title in the eyes of posterity that charter which all frenchmen cherish and which i here swear to maintain let us then rally round it the king was still speaking when a fog spread darkness through the house eyes were turned towards the ceiling to ascertain the cause of that sudden gloom when the king lawgiver ceased to speak the cries of long live the king were renewed amid tears the assembly the monitor truly says electrified by the king's sublime words stood up its hand stretched towards the throne one heard only the words long live the king we will die for the king the king in life and death repeated with an enthusiasm which will be shared by every french heart it was in fact a pathetic sight an old infirm king who in reward for the murder of his family and twenty-three years of exile had brought france peace liberty forgiveness of all outrages and all misfortunes this patriarch of sovereigns coming to declare to the deputies of the nation that at his age after seeing his country again he could not better end his career than by dying in defence of his people the princes swore fidelity to the charter those tardy oaths were closed with that of the prince de conde and with the adhesion of the father of the duc d'enghien this heroic race on the verge of extinction this race of the patrician sword seeking behind liberty a shield against a younger longer and more cruel plebeian sword offered by reason of a multitude of memories a spectacle that was extremely sad when louis the eighteenth's speech became known outside it aroused unspeakable enthusiasm paris was wholly royalist and remained so during the hundred days the women in particular were bourbonists the youth of to-day worships the memory of bonaparte because it is humiliated by the part which the present government makes france play in europe the youth of eighteen fourteen hail the restoration because the latter had thrown down despotism and set up liberty in the ranks of the royal volunteers were included m odilon barreau a large number of pupils of the school of medicine and the whole of the school of law the last on the thirteenth of march addressed this petition to the chamber of deputies gentlemen we offer our services to our king and country the whole school of law asked to go to the front we will abandon neither our king nor our constitution faithful to french honour we ask you for arms the feeling of love which we bear to louis eighteen is answerable to you for the constancy of our devotion we want no more irons we want liberty we have it and they come to snatch it from us we will defend it to the death long live the king long live the constitution in this energetic natural and sincere language one feels the generosity of youth and the love of liberty they who come to tell us to-day that the restoration was received by france with dislike and sorrow are ambitious men who are playing a game or newcomers who have never known bonaparte's oppression or old imperialized revolutionary liars who after applauding the return of the bourbons with the rest now according to their habit insult the fallen and return to their instincts of murder police and servitude the king's speech had filled me with hope conferences were held at the house of the president of the chamber of deputies m lenay i there met m de lafayette i had never seen him except at a distance at another period under the constituent assembly the proposals were various and for the most part weak as happens in peril some wished the king to leave paris and fall back upon the arve others spoke of moving him to the vendee one stammered out unfinished sentences another said that we must wait and see what was coming what was coming was very visible for all that i expressed a very different opinion oddly enough m de lafayette supported it and warmly m lenay and marshal marmont were also of my opinion i said let the king keep his word let him stay in his capital the national guard is on our side let us make sure of vincennes we have the arms and the money with the money we shall overcome weakness and cupidity if the king leaves paris paris will admit bonaparte bonaparte master of paris is master of france the army has not gone over to the enemy as a whole several regiments many generals and officers have not yet betrayed their oaths if we hold firm they will remain faithful let us disperse the royal family let us keep only the king let monsieur go to the havre the duc de berry to lille the duc de bourbon to the vendee the duc d'orleans to metz 
madame la duchesse and monsieur le duc d'angouleme are already in the south our different points of resistance will prevent bonaparte from concentrating his forces let us barricade ourselves in paris already the national guards of the neighbouring departments are coming to our aid amid this movement our old monarch protected by the will of louis xvi will remain peacefully seated on his throne at the tuileries with the charter in his hand the diplomatic body will range itself round him the two chambers will meet in the two wings of the palace the king's household will encamp in the carousel and in the tuileries gardens we shall line the quays and the water terrace with guns let bonaparte attack us in this position let him carry our barricades one by one let him bombard paris if he please and if he have mortars let him make himself odious to the whole population and we shall see the result of his enterprise let us resist for but three days and victory is ours the king defending himself in his palace will arouse universal enthusiasm lastly if he must die let him die worthy of his rank let napoleon's last exploit be to cut an old man's throat louis the eighteenth in sacrificing his life will win the only battle he will have fought he will win it for the benefit of the freedom of the human race thus i spoke one is never entitled to say that all is lost so long as one has attempted nothing what could have been finer than an old son of st louis overthrowing with frenchmen in a few moments a man whom all the confederate kings of europe had taken so many years to lay low this resolution desperate in appearance was very reasonable at bottom and offered not the smallest danger i shall always remain convinced that had bonaparte found paris hostile and the king present he would not have tried to force them without artillery provisions or money he had with him only troops collected at random still wavering astonished at their sudden change of cockade at their oaths taken headlong on the roads they would promptly have become divided a few hours delay and napoleon was lost it but needed a little heart already even we could rely on a portion of the army the two swiss regiments were keeping their faith did not marshal gouvion saint cyr make the orleans garrison resume the white cockade two days after bonaparte's entry into paris from marseilles to bordeaux all recognized the king's authority during the whole month of march at bordeaux the troops were hesitating they would have remained with madame la duchesse d'angouleme if the news had come that the king was at the tuileries and that paris was being defended the provincial towns would have imitated paris the tenth regiment of the line fought very well under the duc d'angouleme massena was proving himself crafty and uncertain at lille the garrison responded to marshal mortier's stirring proclamation if all those proofs of a possible fidelity took place in spite of a flight what would they not have been in the case of a resistance had my plan been adopted the foreigners would not have ravaged france afresh our princes would not have returned with the hostile armies the legitimacy would have been saved through itself one thing alone would have to be feared after success the too great confidence of the royalty in its strength and consequently attempts upon the rights of the nation why did i arrive at a period in which i was so ill-placed why have i been a royalist against my instinct at a time when a miserable race of courtiers was unable either to hear or to understand me why was i flung into that troop of mediocrities who took me for a raver when i spoke of courage for a revolutionary when i spoke of liberty a fine question of defence indeed the king had no fear and my plan rather pleased him through a certain louis quatorzian grandeur but other faces had lengthened they packed up the crown diamonds formerly purchased out of the privy purse of the sovereigns leaving thirty-three million crowns in the treasury and forty-two millions in securities those sixty-five millions were the produce of taxation why was it not returned to the people rather than left to tyranny a dual procession passed up and down the staircases of the pavillon de flore people were asking what they were to do no answer they applied to the captain of the guards they questioned the chaplains the precentors the almoners nothing vain talk vain retailing of news i saw young men weep with rage when uselessly asking for orders and arms i saw women faint with anger and contempt access to the king was impossible etiquette closed the door the great measure decreed against bonaparte was an order to hunt him down louis the eighteenth with no legs hunting down the conqueror who bestrode the earth this form of the ancient laws renewed for the occasion is enough to show the compass of mind of the statesmen of that period to hunt down in eighteen fifteen hunt down and hunt whom hunt a wolf hunt a brigand chieftain hunt a felon lord no hunt napoleon who had hunted down kings who had seized and branded them for all time on the shoulder with his indelible n from this order when considered more closely sprang a political truth which no one saw 
the legitimate house estranged from the nation for three and twenty years had remained at the day and place at which the revolution had caught it whereas the nation had progressed in point of time and space hence the impossibility of understanding and meeting one another religion ideas interests language earth and heaven all were different for the people and for the king because they were separated by a quarter of a century equivalent to centuries but if the order to hunt down appears strange owing to the preservation of the old idiom of the law had bonaparte originally the intention of acting better although employing a newer language papers of m d'autrive catalogued by m Artaud, prove that it caused great difficulty to prevent napoleon from having the duc d'angoulême shot in spite of the official document in the moniteur a show document which remains to us he thought it wrong of the prince to have defended himself and yet the fugitive from elba when leaving fontainebleau had recommended the soldiers to be faithful to the monarch whom france had chosen bonaparte's family had been respected queen hortense had accepted from louis the eighteenth the title of duchesse de saint lier murat who still reigned in naples saw his kingdom sold by m de talleyrand only during the congress of vienna this period in which all are lacking in frankness oppresses the heart every one threw out a profession of faith as it were a footbridge to cross the difficulty of the day free to change his direction the difficulty once passed youth alone was sincere because it was near its cradle bonaparte solemnly declared that he renounced the crown he departed and returned after nine months benjamin constant printed his vehement protests against the tyrant and he changed in twenty-four hours it will be seen later in another book of these memoirs who inspired him with the noble impulse to which the fickleness of his nature did not permit him to remain faithful marshal so excited the troops against their old leader a few days later he was roaring with laughter at his own proclamation in napoleon's closet at the tuileries and became major-general of the army at waterloo marshal ney kissed the king's hands swore to bring him bonaparte locked up in an iron cage and handed over to the latter all the corps under his command and the king of france alas he declared that at the age of sixty years he could not better end his career than by dying in defence of his people and fled to ghent at sight of this incapacity for truth in men's feelings and the want of harmony between their words and their deeds one feels seized with disgust for the human kind louis the eighteenth on the sixteenth of march was declaring his intention of dying in the midst of france had he kept his word the legitimacy might have lasted another century nature herself seemed to have taken from the old king the power of retreating by chaining him about with wholesome infirmities but the future destinies of the human race would have been trammelled by the accomplishment of the resolution of the author of the charter bonaparte hastened to the assistance of the future that christ of the power for evil took the new man sick of the palsy by the hand and said to him arise take up thy bed and walk End of Book 4, Part 1book four part two of the memoirs of chateaubriand volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee the memoirs of chateaubriand volume three by francois rene de chateaubriand translated by alexander texera de matos book four part two it was evident that a scamper was being contemplated for fear of being detained they did not even warn those who like myself would have been shot within an hour after napoleon's entry into paris i met the duc de richelieu in the champs elysees they are deceiving us he said i am keeping watch here for i do not propose to await the emperor at the tuileries all by myself on the evening of the nineteenth madame de chateaubriand had sent a servant to the carousel with instructions not to return until he had the certainty of the flight of the king at midnight as the man had not come in i went to my room i had just gone to bed when m clausel de cousseg entered he told us that his majesty had left and had gone in the direction of lille he brought me this news on the part of the chancellor who knowing me to be in danger was violating secrecy on my behalf and sent me twelve thousand francs recoverable on my salary as minister to sweden i was obstinately bent on remaining not wishing to leave paris until i should be physically certain of the royal removal the servant who had been sent to reconnoitre returned he had seen the court carriages go by madame de chateaubriand pushed me into her carriage at four o'clock in the morning on the twentieth of march i was in such a fit of fury that i knew neither where i was going nor what i was doing we passed out through the barriere saint martin at dawn i saw crows coming down peacefully from the elms on the high road where they had spent the night to take their first meal in the fields without troubling their heads about louis the eighteenth and napoleon 
they were not obliged to leave their country and thanks to their wings they were able to laugh at the bad road along which i was being jolted old friends of combourg we were more alike in the old days when at break of day we used to breakfast on mulberries from the brambles in the thickets of brittany the roadway was broken up the weather rainy madame de chateaubriand poorly she looked every moment through the little window at the back of the carriage to see if we were not being pursued we slept at amiens where Ducange was born next at arras the birthplace of robespierre there i was recognized when we sent for horses on the morning of the twenty second the postmaster said that they had been engaged for a general who was taking to lille the news of the triumphal entry of the emperor king into paris madame de chateaubriand was dying of fright not for herself but for me i ran to the post office and removed the difficulty with money on arriving under the ramparts of lille at two in the morning of the twenty third we found the gates closed the orders were not to open them to any one whomsoever they could not or would not tell us if the king had entered the town i induced the postilion for a few louis to make for the other side of the place outside the glacis and to drive us to tournay in seventeen ninety two i had covered the same road on foot during the night with my brother on arriving at tournay i learnt that louis the eighteenth had certainly entered lille with marshal mortier and that he meant to defend himself there i dispatched a courier to m de blacas asking him to send me a permit to be received into the place my courier returned with a permit from the commandant but not a word from m de blacas leaving madame de chateaubriand at tournay i was getting into the carriage again to go to lille when the prince de conde arrived we learnt through him that the king had gone and that marshal mortier had had him accompanied to the frontier from these explanations it became clear that louis the eighteenth was no longer at lille when my letter arrived there the duc d'orleans followed close after the prince de conde under an apparent dissatisfaction he was glad at bottom to find himself out of the hurly-burly the ambiguousness of his declaration and of his behaviour bore the stamp of his character as to the old prince de conde the emigration was his household god he had no fear of m de bonaparte not he he fought if they liked or went away if they liked things were a little muddled in his brain he was none too clear as to whether he should stop at Ocroix to give battle there or go to dine at the white hart he struck his tents a few hours before us telling me to recommend the coffee at the inn to the members of his household whom he had left behind he did not know that i had sent in my resignation on the death of his grandson he was not very sure that he had had a grandson he only felt a certain increase of glory in his name which might come from some conde whom he had forgotten do you remember my first passing through tournay with my brother at the time of my first emigration do you remember in that connection the man transformed into a donkey the girl from whose ears grew corn-spikes the rain of ravens that set everything on fire in eighteen fifteen indeed we ourselves were a rain of ravens but we set nothing on fire alas i was no longer with my unfortunate brother between seventeen ninety two and eighteen fifteen the republic and the empire had passed what revolutions had also been accomplished in my life time had ravaged me like the rest and you the young generations of the moment let twenty-three years come and then tell me in my tomb what has become of your loves and your illusions of to-day the two brothers bertin had arrived at tournay m bertin de vaux returned from there to paris the other bertin bertin the elder was my friend you know through these memoirs what it was that attached me to him from tournay we went to brussels there i found no baron de Bouteuil, nor rivarol nor all those young aides de camp who had become dead or old which is the same thing no news of the barber who had given me shelter i did not take up the musket but the pen from a soldier i had become a paper stainer i was looking for louis the eighteenth he was at ghent where he had been taken by Monsieur de Blacas and de Duras. Their first intention had been to ship the king to England. If the king had consented to this plan, he would never have reascended the throne. Having gone into a lodging-house to look at an apartment, I perceived the Duc de Richelieu smoking, half outstretched, on a sofa, at the back of a dark room. He spoke to me of the princess in the most brutal manner, declaring that he was going to Russia, and that he would not hear another word about those people. Madame la Duchesse de Duras, on arriving in Brussels, had the sorrow to lose her niece there i loathe the brabant capital it has never served me except as a passage to my exiles it has always brought sorrow upon myself or my friends an order of the king summoned me to ghent the royal volunteers and the duc de berry's little army had been disbanded at bethune in the middle of the mud and of the accidents of a military breaking up 
touching farewells had been exchanged two hundred men of the king's household remained and were quartered at alos my two nephews louis and christian de chateaubriand formed part of that corps i had been given a billet of which i did not avail myself a baroness whose name i have forgotten came to see madame de chateaubriand at the inn and offered us an apartment in her house she implored us with so good a grace you must pay no attention she said to anything my husband says his head is a little you understand my daughter also is a trifle eccentric she has terrible moments poor child but the rest of the time she is as gentle as a lamb alas it is not she who causes me the greatest trouble but my son louis the youngest of my children without god's help he will be worse than his father madame de chateaubriand politely refused to go and live with such rational people the king well lodged having his service and his guards formed his council the empire of that great monarch consisted of a house in the kingdom of the netherlands which house was situated in a town which although the birthplace of charles v had been the chief town of a prefecture of bonaparte's those names comprise between them a goodly number of centuries and events the abbe de montesquieu being in london louis the eighteenth appointed me minister of the interior ad interim my correspondence with the departments did not give me much to do i easily kept up my correspondence with the prefects sub-prefects mayors and deputy mayors of our good towns on the inner side of our frontiers i did not repair the roads much and i let the steeples tumble down my budget hardly enriched me i had no secret funds only by a crying abuse i was a pluralist i was still his majesty's minister plenipotentiary to the king of sweden who like his fellow townsman henry the fourth reigned by right of conquest if not by right of birth we discoursed round a table covered with a green cloth in the king's closet m de lally tollendal who was i think minister of public instruction delivered speeches even more voluminous and more inflated than his cheeks he quoted his illustrious ancestors the kings of ireland and muddled up his father's trial with those of charles i and louis xvi he refreshed himself in the evening after the tears the sweat and the words which he had shed at the council with the lady who had come all the way from paris out of enthusiasm for his genius he virtuously strove to cure her but his eloquence betrayed his virtue and drove the dart more deeply madame la duchesse de durat had come to join monsieur le duc de durat among the exiles i will speak no more ill of misfortune because i have spent three months with that admirable woman talking of all that upright minds and hearts can find in a conformity of tastes ideas principles and feelings madame de durat was ambitious for me she alone saw at once what i might be worth in political life she always deplored the envy and short-sightedness which kept me removed from the king's counsels but she even much more deplored the obstacles which my character placed in the way of my fortune she scolded me she wanted to correct me of my indifference my candour my ingenuousness and to make me adopt habits of courtierism which she herself could not endure nothing perhaps leads to greater attachment and gratitude than to feel oneself under the patronage of a superior friendship which by virtue of its ascendancy over society passes off your defects as good qualities your imperfections as an attraction a man protects you through his worth a woman through your worth that is why of those two empires one is so hateful the other so sweet since i have lost that great-hearted person gifted with a soul so noble with an intelligence which combines something of the strength of the thought of madame de Steele with the grace of the talent of madame de lafayette i have never ceased while mourning her to reproach myself with any unevenness of temper with which i may sometimes have wounded hearts that were devoted to me let us keep a close watch upon our character let us remember that with a profound attachment we can nevertheless poison days which we would buy back again at the price of all our blood when our friends have sunk into the grave what means have we to repair our trespasses our useless regrets our vain repentings are those a remedy for the pain that we have given them they would have preferred one smile from us during their life than all our tears after their death the charming clara was at ghent with her mother we two made up bad couplets to the air of the tyrolienne i have held many pretty little girls on my knees who are young grandmothers to-day when you have left a woman married in your presence at sixteen years of age if you return sixteen years later you find her of the same age still ah madame you have not put on a day no doubt but it is the daughter to whom you are saying so the daughter whom you will also lead up to the altar 
but you a sad witness to both hymens you treasure up the sixteen years which you received at each union a wedding present which will hasten your own marriage with a white-haired lady rather thin marshal victor had come to join us at ghent with an admirable simplicity he asked for nothing never teased the king with his assiduity one scarcely saw him i do not know whether he ever had the honour and the favour of being invited on a single occasion to his majesty's dinner-party i have met marshal victor since i have been his colleague in office and i have always perceived the same excellent nature in paris in eighteen twenty three monsieur le dauphin was very harsh to that honest soldier it was very good of this duc de belune to repay such easy ingratitude with such modest devotion candour carries me away and touches me even when on certain occasions it attains the final expression of its ingenuousness for instance the marshal told me of his wife's death in the language of a soldier and he made me weep he pronounced coarse words so quickly and changed them so chastely that one might even have written them m de vaublanc and m capel joined us the former used to say that he had some of everything in his portfolio do you want some montesquieu here you are some bossuet here it is in proportion as the game seemed about to take a different turn more travellers arrived the abbe louis and m le comte beugnot alighted at the inn where i was lodging madame de chateaubriand was suffering from terrible fits of choking and i was sitting up with her the two newcomers installed themselves in a room separated from my wife's only by a thin partition it was impossible not to hear unless by stopping one's ears between eleven and twelve at night the new arrivals raised their voices the abbe louis who spoke like a wolf and in jerks was saying to m beugnot you a minister you'll never be one again you have committed one stupidity after the other i could not clearly hear m le comte beugnot's answer but he spoke of thirty-three millions left behind in the royal treasury the abbe apparently in anger pushed a chair which fell down through the uproar i caught these words the duc d'angouleme he'll have to buy his national property at the gates of paris i shall sell what remains of the state forests i shall cut down everything the elms on the high roads the bois de boulogne the champs elysees what's the use of all that eh brutality formed m louis's principal merit his talent lay in a stupid love of material interests if the minister of finance drew the forests after him he had doubtless a different secret from that of orpheus who made the woods go after him with his fail fiddling in the slang of the time m louis was known as a special man his speciality of finance had led him to accumulate the taxpayers money in the treasury in order to let it be taken by bonaparte napoleon had had no use for this special man who was in no sense an unique man and who was at the most good enough for the directory the abbe louis had gone to ghent to claim his office he was in very good favour with m de talleyrand with whom he had solemnly officiated at the first federation in the Chambre de Mars. the bishop was the celebrant the abbe louis the deacon and the abbe de renaud the subdeacon m de talleyrand recollecting this admirable profanation used to say to the baron louis abbe you were very fine as the deacon in the Chambre de Mars. we endured this shame under the great tyranny of bonaparte ought we to have endured it later the most christian king had screened himself from any reproach of bigotry he owned in his council a married bishop m de talleyrand a priest living in concubinage m louis a non-practising abbe m de montesquieu the last named a man as feverish as a consumptive gifted with a certain glibness of speech had a narrow and disparaging mind a malignant heart a sour character one day when i had made a speech at the luxembourg on behalf of the liberty of the press the descendant of clovis passing in front of me who went by only to the breton Montmorin, caught me a great blow with his knee in my thigh which was not in good taste i gave him one back which was not polite we played at the duc de la rochefoucauld and the coadjutor the abbe de montesquieu humorously called m de lally tolondal an english beast in the rivers at ghent they catch a very dainty white fish we use tutti quanti to go to eat this good fish in a suburban roadside inn while waiting for the battles and the end of empires m laborie never failed us at our meetings i had first met him at savigny when fleeing from bonaparte he came in at madame de beaumont's by one window and made his way out by another indefatigable at work renewing his errands as often as his bills as fond of doing services as others are of receiving them he has been calumniated calumny is not the impeachment of the calumniated but the excuse of the calumniator i have seen men grow tired of the promises in which m laborie was so rich but why 
Illusions are like torture. They always help to pass an hour or two. I have often led by the head with a golden bridle, old hacks of memory, unable to stand on their legs, which I took for young and frisky hopes. I also met M. Munier at the white fish dinners, a sensible and upright man. M. Guizot deigned to honour us with his presence. A monitor had been started at Ghent. My report to the King of the 12th of May, inserted in that journal, proves that my feelings on the liberty of the press and on foreign domination have at all times been the same. I can quote the following passages today. You were preparing to crown the institutions of which you had laid the foundation stone. You had fixed a period for the commencement of the hereditary peerage. The ministry would have gained greater unity. The ministers would have become members of the two chambers, according to the true spirit of the charter. A law would have been brought in to allow the election of a member of the chamber of deputies before the age of forty, so that citizens might have had a real political career. It was proposed to discuss a penal code for press offences, after the adoption of which law the press would have been entirely free, for that freedom is inseparable from all representative government. Sire, and this is the occasion solemnly to protest it, all your ministers, all the members of your council, are inviolably attached to the principles of a wise liberty. They derive from you that love of laws, of order and of justice, without which there can be no happiness for a people. Sire, let us be permitted to say that we are ready to shed the last drop of our blood for you, to follow you to the ends of the earth, to share with you the tribulations which it will please the Almighty to send you, because we believe before God that you will maintain the constitution which you have given to your people, and that the sincerest wish of your royal heart is the liberty of Frenchmen. Had it been otherwise, sire, we would all have died at your feet in defence of your sacred person, but we would have been only your soldiers. We would have ceased to be your counsellors and your ministers. Sire, at this moment we share your royal sadness. There is not one of your counsellors and ministers who would not give up his life to prevent the invasion of France. You, sire, are a Frenchman. We are Frenchmen, alive to the honour of our country, proud of the glory of our arms, admirers of the courage of our soldiers. We would be willing, in the midst of your battalions, to shed the last drop of our blood to bring them back to their duty, or to share lawful triumphs with them. We can only look with the deepest sorrow upon the ills that are ready to break over our country. Thus again did I propose to add to the charter that which it still lacked, while displaying my sorrow at the new invasion which was threatening France. Nevertheless, I was only an exile whose wishes were in contradiction with the facts which could again open the gates of my country to me. Those pages were written in the states of the Allied sovereigns, among kings and emigrants who detested the liberty of the press, in the midst of armies, marching to conquest of whom we were, so to speak, the prisoners. These circumstances perhaps add some strength to the feelings which I venture to express. My report on reaching Paris made a great noise. It was reprinted by M. Lenormand, the younger, who risked his life upon this occasion, and for whom I had all the difficulty in the world to obtain a barren warrant of printer to the king. Bonaparte acted, or allowed others to act, in a manner unworthy of him. On the occasion of my report, they did what the directory had done, on the appearance of Clery's memoirs. They falsified fragments of it. I was made to propose to Louis the Eighteenth stupid ideas for the revival of feudal rights, for the tithes of the clergy, for the recovery of the national property, as though the printing of the original piece in the Monitor de Gaulle, at a fixed and known date, did not confound the imposture. The pseudonymous writer, entrusted with the production of an insincere pamphlet, was a soldier fairly high up in rank. He was dismissed after the hundred days. His dismissal was ascribed to his conduct towards me. He sent his friends to me. They begged me to intervene, lest a man of merit should lose his sole means of existence. I wrote to the Minister of War, and obtained a retiring pension for this officer. He is dead. His wife has remained attached to Madame de Chateaubriand, by a feeling of gratitude to which I was far from having any claim. Certain proceedings are too highly prized. The most ordinary persons are susceptible to such feelings of generosity. A name for virtue is cheaply acquired. The superior mind is not that which pardons, but that which has no need of pardon. I do not know where Bonaparte, at St. Helena, discovered that I had rendered essential services at Ghent. If he judged the part I played too favourably, at least there lay behind his opinion an appreciation of my political value. I avoided at Ghent, as far as I could, intrigues which were opposed to my character and contemptible in my eyes, for at bottom I perceived in our paltry catastrophe the catastrophe of society. 
my refuge against the idlers and rogues was the oncle du beguinage i used to walk round that little world of veiled or tuckered women consecrated to different christian works a calm region placed like the african quicksands on the edge of the tempests there no incongruity shocked my ideas for the sentiment of religion is so lofty that it is never irrelevant to the gravest revolutions the solitaries of the thebaid and the barbarians destroyers of the roman world are in no way discordant facts or mutually exclusive existences i was graciously received in the close as the author of the genie du christianisme wherever i go among christians the curates flock round me next come the mothers bringing me their children the latter recite to me my chapter on the first communion then appear unhappy persons who tell me of the good i have had the happiness to do them my passage through a catholic town is announced like that of a missionary or a physician i am touched by this dual reputation it is the only agreeable memory of myself that i retain i dislike myself in all the rest of my personality and my reputation i was pretty often invited to festive dinners in the family of monsieur and madame d'op a venerable father and mother surrounded by some thirty children grandchildren and great-grandchildren at m coppens a banquet which i was obliged to accept was prolonged from one in the afternoon to eight in the evening i counted nine courses they began with the preserves and finished with the cutlets the french alone know how to dine methodically just as they alone know how to compose a book my ministry kept me at ghent madame de chateaubriand less busy went to see ostend where i had embarked for jersey in seventeen ninety two i had travelled a dying exile down the same canals along whose banks i now walked still in exile but in perfect health there has always been something fabulous in my career the miseries and joys of my first emigration revived in my thoughts i saw england again my companions in misfortune and charlotte whom i was to meet once more there is no one like myself to create a real society by calling up shadows it goes so far that the life of my memories absorbs the feeling of my real life even persons with whom i have never occupied myself if they come to die invade my memory one would say that none can become my companion if he has not passed through the tomb which leads me to think that i am a dead man where others find an eternal separation i find an eternal union when one of my friends departs this earth it is as though he had come to make my home his own he never leaves me again according as the present world retires the past world returns to me if the actual generations scorn the generations that have grown old they waste their disdain where i am concerned i am not even aware of their existence my golden fleece had not yet reached bruges madame de chateaubriand did not bring it to me at bruges in fourteen twenty six there was a man whose name was john who invented or perfected the art of painting in oils let us be grateful to john of bruges but for the propagation of his method raphael's masterpieces would be obliterated to-day where did the flemish painters steal the light with which they illumined their pictures what ray from greece strayed to batavia's shore after her journey to ostend madame de chateaubriand took a trip to antwerp there she saw in a cemetery plaster souls in purgatory smeared all over with fire and black at louvain she recruited a stammerer a learned professor who came expressly to ghent to gaze upon a man so out of the ordinary as my wife's husband he said to me illustre his speech fell short of his admiration and i asked him to dinner when the hellenists had drunk some curaçao his tongue became loosened we got upon the merits of thucydides whom the wine made us find clear as water by dint of keeping up with my guest i ended i believe by talking dutch at least i no longer understood what i was saying madame de chateaubriand spent a bad night at the inn at antwerp a young englishwoman recently confined lay dying during two hours she made her groans heard then her voice weakened and her last moan which the stranger's ear could scarcely catch was lost in an eternal silence the cries of this traveller solitary and forsaken might be taken as a prelude to the thousand voices of death about to rise at waterloo the customary solitude of ghent was rendered more striking by the foreign crowd which was then enlivening it and which was soon to disperse belgian and english recruits were learning their drill on the squares and under the trees of the public walks gunners contractors dragoons were landing trains of artillery herds of oxen horses which struggled in the air while they were being let down in straps canteen women came on shore carrying the sacks the children the muskets of their husbands all these were going without knowing why and without having the smallest interest in it to the great rendezvous of destruction which bonaparte had given them 
one saw politicians gesticulating along a canal near a motionless angler emigrants trotting from the kings to messieurs from messieurs to the kings the chancellor of france m dombray in a green coat and a round hat with an old novel under his arm walked to the council to amend the charter the duc de levy went to pay his court in a pair of old loose shoes which dropped from his feet because brave man and new achilles that he was he had been wounded in the heel he was very witty as can be judged by the selection from his reflections the duke of wellington used to come occasionally to hold a review louis the eighteenth went out every afternoon in a coach and six with his first lord of the bedchamber and his guards to drive round ghent just as though he had been in paris if he met the duke of wellington on his road he would give him a little patronizing nod in passing louis eighteenth never lost sight of the pre-eminence of his cradle he was a king everywhere as god is god everywhere in a manger or in a temple on an altar of gold or of clay never did his misfortune wring the smallest concession from him his loftiness increased in the ratio of his depression his diadem was his name he seemed to say kill me you will not kill the sentries inscribed upon my brow if they had scraped his arms off the louvre it signified little to him were they not engraved on the globe had commissioners been sent to scratch them off in every corner of the universe had they been erased in india at pondicherry in america at lima and mexico in the east at antioch jerusalem acre cairo constantinople rhodes in the morea in the west on the walls of rome on the ceilings of caserta and the escorial on the arches of the halls of ratisbon and westminster in the escutcheon of all the kings had they been torn from the needle of the compass where they seemed to proclaim the reign of the lilies to the several regions of the earth the fixed idea of the grandeur the antiquity the dignity the majesty of his house gave louis the eighteenth a real empire one felt its dominion even bonaparte's generals confessed it they stood more intimidated before that impotent old man than before the terrible master who had commanded them in a hundred battles in paris when louis eighteen accorded to the triumphing monarchs the honour of dining at his table he passed without ceremony before those princes whose soldiers were camping in the courtyard of the louvre he treated them like vassals who had only done their duty in bringing men-at-arms to their liege lord in europe there is but one monarchy that of france the destiny of the other monarchies is bound up in the fate of that one all the royal houses are of yesterday beside the house of hugh capet and almost all are its daughters our old royal power was the old royalty of the world from the banishment of the capets will date the era of the expulsion of the kings the more impolitic that haughtiness on the part of the descendant of st louis it became fatal to his heirs the more pleasing was it to the national pride the french rejoiced at seeing sovereigns who when conquered had borne the chains of a man bear as conquerors the yoke of a dynasty the unshaken faith of louis the eighteenth in his blood is the real might that restored his sceptre it was that faith which twice let fall upon his head a crown for which europe certainly did not believe did not pretend that she was exhausting her populations and her treasures the soldierless exile was to be found at the issue of all the battles which he had not delivered louis eighteenth was the legitimacy incarnate it ceased to be visible when he disappeared at ghent i took walks by myself as i do wherever i go the barges gliding along narrow canals obliged to cross ten or twelve leagues of pasture land to reach the sea appear to be sailing over the grass they reminded me of the canoes of the savages in the wild oat marshes of missouri standing at the edge of the water while they were dipping lengths of brown holland i let my eyes wander over the steeples of the town its history appeared to me on the clouds in the sky the citizens of ghent revolting against henri de chatillon the french governor the wife of edward the third bringing forth john of gaunt the stock of the house of lancaster the popular reign of van artevelde good people who moves you why are you so incensed against me in what can i have angered you you must die cried the people it is what time cries to all of us later i saw the dukes of burgundy the spaniards came then the pacification the sieges and the captures of ghent when i had done musing among the sentries the sound of a little bugle or a scotch bagpipe would rouse me i saw living soldiers hastening to join the buried battalions of batavia ever destructions powers overthrown and at last a few faded shadows and some names that had passed seaboard flanders was one of the first cantonments of the companions of clodion and clovis ghent bruges and the surrounding country furnished nearly a tenth of the grenadiers of the old guard that terrible army was in part drawn from the cradle of our fathers 
and came in its turn to be exterminated beside that cradle did the leek give its flower to the arms of our kings spanish manners leave the impress of their character the buildings of ghent retrace for me those of granada less the sky of the vega a large town almost bereft of inhabitants deserted streets canals as deserted as the streets twenty-six islands formed by those canals which were not the canals of venice a huge piece of ordnance of the middle ages that is what replaced at ghent the city of the zegris the duero and the zenil the henoalife and the alhambra old dreams of mine shall i ever see you more madame la duchesse d'angouleme who had taken ship on the gironde came to us by way of england with general donadier and m de Sez, of whom the latter had crossed the ocean wearing his blue ribbon across his waistcoat the duke and duchesse de levy followed in the princess suite they had flung themselves into the diligence and escaped from paris by the bordeaux road their fellow-travellers talked politics that scoundrel of a chateaubriand said one of them is no such fool he had his carriage waiting packed in his courtyard for three days the bird has flown they would have made short work of him if napoleon had caught him madame la duchesse de levy was a very handsome very kind woman and as calm as madame la duchesse de durat was restless she never left madame de chateaubriand's side she was our assiduous companion at ghent no one has diffused more quietude in my life a thing of which i have great need the least troubled moments of my existence are those which i spent at noisiel in the house of that woman whose words and sentiments entered into your soul only to restore its serenity i recall with regret those moments passed under the great chestnut trees of noisiel with a soothed spirit a convalescent heart i used to look upon the ruins of shell abbey and the little lights of the boats loitering among the willows on the marne the remembrance of madame de levy is for me that of a silent autumn evening she passed away in a few hours she mingled with death as with the source of all rest i saw her sink noiselessly into her grave in the cemetery of pere lachaise she is laid above m de fontanes and the latter sleeps beside his son saint marcelin killed in a duel thus bowing before the monument of madame de levy have i come into contact with two other sepulchres man cannot awaken one sorrow without reawakening another during the night the different flowers which open only in the shade expand to madame de levy's affectionate kindness for me was added the friendship of m le duc de levy the father i may now reckon only by generations m de levy wrote well he had a versatile and fertile imagination which betrayed his noble race as it had already displayed itself in his blood shed on the beach at quiberon nor was that to be the end of all it was the impulse of a friendship which passed on to the second generation m le duc de levy the son attached at present to m le comte de chambord has drawn near to me my hereditary affection will fail him no more than will my fidelity to his august master the new and charming duchesse de levy his wife joins to the great name of d'aubusson the brightest qualities of heart and mind life is worth something when the graces borrow unwearied wings from history the pavillon massin existed at ghent as in paris every day brought monsieur news from france which was the offspring of self-interest or imagination monsieur gaillard an ex-oratorian a counsel in the royal courts an intimate friend of fouché's alighted in our midst he made himself known and was brought into touch with monsieur capel when i waited upon monsieur which was rarely those around him used to talk to me in covert words and with many sighs of a man who it must be admitted was behaving admirably he was impeding all the emperor's operations he was defending the faubourg st germain etc etc the faithful marshal so was also the object of monsieur's predilection and after fouche the most loyal man in france one day a carriage stopped at the door of my inn and i saw madame la baronne de vitrol step out of it she had arrived bearing powers from the duc d'autrante she took away with her a note written in monsieur's hand in which the prince declared that he would retain an eternal gratitude to him who saved monsieur de vitrol fouche wanted no more armed with this note he was sure of his future in case of a restoration thenceforward there was no question again save of the immense obligations due to the excellent m fouche de nantes save of the impossibility of returning to france otherwise than by that just man's good pleasure the difficulty was how to make the king relish this new redeemer of the monarchy after the hundred days madame de custine compelled me to meet fouche at dinner at her house i had seen him once five years before in connection with the condemnation of my poor cousin Armand. The ex-minister knew that I had opposed his nomination at Roy, at Gonesse, at Arnouville, and as he suspected me of being powerful, he wished to make his peace with me. The death of Louis XVI was the best thing about him. Regicide was his innocence. 
a praetor like all the revolutionaries beating the air with empty phrases he retailed a heap of commonplaces stuffed with destiny with necessity with the right of things mingling with this philosophic nonsense further nonsense on the march and progress of society and shameless maxims in favour of the strong as against the weak and he was free in his use of impudent avowals on the justice of success the little worth of a head which falls the equity of that which prospers the iniquity of that which suffers affecting to speak of the most horrid disasters with airy indifference as though he were a genius above all such fooleries not a choice idea escaped him not a remarkable thought on any subject whatsoever i went away shrugging my shoulders at crime m fouche never forgave me my dryness and the small effect he produced on me he had thought he would fascinate me by causing the blade of the fatal instrument to rise and fall before my eyes like a glory of mount sinai he had imagined that i would look up as to a colossus to the ranter who speaking of the soil of lyon has said that soil shall be overturned on the ruins of that proud and rebellious city shall rise scattered cottages which the friends of liberty will hasten to come and inhabit we shall have the energetic courage to walk through the vast tombs of the conspirators their blood-stained corpses hurled into the rhone give on both banks and at its mouth the impression of terror and the image of the omnipotence of the people we shall celebrate the victory of toulon we shall this evening send two hundred and fifty rebels under the lead of the thunder those horrible trimmings did not impose upon me because m de nantes had diluted republican crimes with imperial mire because a sansculotte transformed into a duke had wrapped the cord of the lantern in the ribbon of the legion of honour he appeared neither the abler nor the greater for it in my eyes the jacobins detest men who make no account of their atrocities and who despise their murders their pride is provoked like that of authors whose talent one disputes at the same time that fouche was sending m gaillard to ghent to negotiate with the brother of louis xvi his agents at Bar were parleying with those of prince metternich on the subject of napoleon the second and m de saint leon dispatched by this same fouche was arriving in vienna to treat of the crown as a possibility for m le duc d'orleans the friends of the duc d'autrant could rely upon him no more than his enemies on the return of the legitimate princes he maintained his old colleague m thibaudot on the list of exiles while m de talleyrand struck this or that outlaw off the list or added that other to the catalogue according to his whim had not the faubourg saint-germain reason indeed to believe in m fouche m de saint leon carried three notes to vienna of which one was addressed to m de talleyrand the duc d'autrant proposed that the ambassador of louis the eighteenth should push the son of egalite on to the throne if he saw his way what probity in those negotiations how fortunate they were to have to do with such honest persons yet we have admired sensed blessed those highway robbers we have paid court to them we have called them monseigneur that explains the world as it stands m de montrand came in addition after m de saint leon m le duc d'orleans did not conspire in fact but by consent he let the revolutionary finish his intrigue a sweet society in this dark lane the plenipotentiary of the king of france lent an ear to fouche's overtures speaking of m de talleyrand's detention at the barriere d'enfer i said what had till then been m de talleyrand's fixed idea as to the regency of marie louise he was obliged by the emergency to embrace the eventuality of the bourbons but he was always ill at ease it seemed to him that under the heirs of st louis a married bishop would never be sure of his place the idea of substituting the younger branch for the elder branch pleased him therefore so much so the more in that he had had former relations with the palais royal taking that side without however exposing himself entirely he hazarded a few words of fouche's project to alexander the czar had ceased to interest himself in louis the eighteenth the latter had hurt him in paris by his affectation of superiority of race he had hurt him again by refusing to consent to the marriage of the duc de berry with the sister of the emperor the princess was rejected for three reasons she was a schismatic she was not of an old enough stock she came of a family of madmen these reasons were not put forward upright but aslant and when seen through gave alexander treble offence as the last subject of complaint against the old sovereign of exile the czar brought up the projected alliance between england france and austria for the rest it seemed as though the succession were open all the world claimed to succeed to the estate of the sons of louis xiv benjamin constant in the name of madame murat was pleading the rights which napoleon's sister believed herself to possess over the kingdom of naples bernadotte was casting a distant glance upon versailles apparently because the king of sweden came from pau 
la benardiere head of a department at the foreign office went over it to m de colincourt he drew up a hurried report on the complaints and rejoinders of france to the legitimacy after this kick had been let fly m de talleyrand found means of communicating the report to alexander discontented and fickle the autocrat was struck with la benardiere's pamphlet suddenly in the middle of the congress the czar asked to the general stupefaction if it would not be a matter for deliberation to examine in how far m le duc d'orleans might suit france and europe as king this is perhaps one of the most surprising things in those extraordinary times and perhaps it is still more extraordinary that it has been so little discussed lord clancarty made the russian proposal fall through his lordship declared that he had no powers to treat so grave a question as for myself he said giving my opinion as a private individual i think that to put m le duc d'orleans on the throne of france would be to replace a military usurpation by a family usurpation which is more dangerous to the sovereigns than any other usurpation the members of the congress went to dinner using the sceptre of st louis as a rush with which to mark the folio at which they had left off in their proceeds upon the obstacles encountered by the czar m de talleyrand faced about for seeing that the stroke would resound he sent a report to louis the eighteenth in a dispatch which i have seen and which was numbered twenty five or twenty seven of this strange session of the congress he thought himself obliged to inform his majesty of so exorbitant a proceeding because anew said he would not long delay in reaching the king's ears a singular ingenuousness for m le prince de talleyrand there had been a question of a declaration on the part of the alliance in order to make it quite clear to the world that there was no quarrel except with napoleon but there was no pretension to impose upon france either an obligatory form of government or a sovereign who should not be of her own choice this latter part of the declaration was suppressed but it was positively announced to the official journal of frankfort england in her negotiations with the cabinets always employed that liberal language which is only a precaution against a parliamentary tribune we see that the allies were troubling themselves no more about the re-establishment of the legitimacy at the second than at the first restoration the event alone did all what mattered it to such short-sighted sovereigns whether the mother of european monarchies had her throat cut would that prevent them from giving entertainments and keeping guards the monarchs are so solidly seated to-day the globe in one hand the sword in the other m de talleyrand whose interests were at that time in vienna feared lest the english whose opinion was no longer so favourable to him should begin the military game before all the armies were drawn up in line and lest the cabinet of st james should thus acquire the predominance that is why he wished to induce the king to re-enter by the south-eastern provinces in order that he might find himself under the protection of the austrian empire and cabinet the duke of wellington had given a precise order not to commence hostilities it was napoleon who wanted the battle of waterloo the destinies of such a nature are not to be arrested those historic facts the most curious in the world have remained generally unknown in the same way also a confused opinion has been formed of the treaties of vienna relating to france they have been thought the iniquitous work of a troop of victorious sovereigns implacably bent upon our ruin unfortunately if they are harsh they have been envenomed by a french hand when m de talleyrand is not conspiring he is trafficking prussia desired to have saxony which will sooner or later be her prey france ought to have countenanced this wish for saxony obtaining an indemnification within the sphere of the rhine landau would have remained to us with our surrounding territories coblenz and other fortresses would have passed to a small friendly state which placed between ourselves and prussia prevented any point of contact the keys of france would not have been handed over to the shade of frederick for three millions which saxony paid him m de talleyrand opposed the combinations of the cabinet of berlin but in order to obtain the assent of alexander to the existence of old saxony our ambassador was obliged to abandon poland to the czar notwithstanding that the other powers desired that a poland of some kind should restrict the freedom of the muscovites movements in the north the bourbons of naples redeemed themselves like the sovereign of dresden with money m de talleyrand claimed that he was entitled to a subvention in exchange for his duchy of benevento he was selling his livery on leaving his master when france was losing so much could not m de talleyrand also have lost something benevento moreover did not belong to the high chamberlain by virtue of the revival of the ancient treaties that principality was a dependency of the states of the church as such were the diplomatic transactions which were being completed in vienna while we were stopping at ghent in this latter residence i received the following letter from m de talleyrand vienna fourth april i learnt monsieur with much pleasure that you were at ghent for circumstances require 
that the king should be surrounded with strong and independent men you will certainly have thought that it was useful to refute by means of strenuously reasoned publications the whole of the new doctrine which they are trying to establish in the official documents now appearing in france it would be useful if something could appear of which the object would be to establish that the declaration of the thirty first of march made in paris by the allies that the act of deposition that the act of abdication that the treaty of the eleventh of april which resulted from them are so many preliminary indispensable and absolute conditions of the treaty of the thirtieth of may that is to say that without those previous conditions the treaty would not have been made this admitted the man who violates the said conditions or seconds their violation breaks the peace which that treaty established it is therefore he and his accomplices who are declaring war against europe an argument taken in this sense would do good abroad as well as at home only it must be well done so make it your business except monsieur the homage of my sincere attachment and of my high regard Talleyrand, i hope to have the honour of seeing you at the end of the month our minister in vienna was faithful to his hatred of the great chimera escaped from the shades he dreaded a blow from its wing this letter shows for the rest all that m de talleyrand was capable of doing when he wrote alone he had the kindness to teach me the movement leaving the graces to me it was a question indeed of a few diplomatic phrases on the deposition on the abdication on the treaty of the eleventh of april and of the thirtieth of may to stop napoleon i was very grateful for the instructions given me by virtue of my patent as a strong man but i did not follow them an ambassador in petto i was not at that moment meddling with foreign affairs i busied myself only with my ministry of the interior ad interim but what was taking place in paris end of book four part two